Dr. Meyer, that reminds me of many times when we have just done the best we can in a difficult situation and it usually still turned out to be helpful to a patient and family. So I'm sure this will be great as well. Um, seems emblematic. Um, so um, it's my really great privilege to introduce Dr. Diane Meyer. Um, I'm gonna do my best to speak to her many, many accomplishments and the way she has profoundly improved medical care for seriously ill patients and families. Um, given the extent of her contributions, my introduction will just skim the surface. Uh, she received her BA from Oberlin College, her medical degree from Northwestern University. She completed residency and fellowship training in geriatrics at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, and has been on the faculty of the Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at Mount Sinai since 1983. She um, currently serves as Director Emerita and Strategic Medical Advisor of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, which she also founded. Dr. Meyer, along with Dr. Sean Morrison and, and several others, uh, established the palliative medicine program at Mount Sinai in the late 1990s, and she's been a pioneer in establishing the field nationally and internationally. She was the founder and director of the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute in 1997, and with the intention of helping hospitals and health systems all over the country provide best care to patients and families, she founded the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI. Under her leadership, the number of palliative care programs in the U.S. hospitals has tripled since 2002. It might even be higher than that now. And we're actually CAPSI members at MedStar. We all have access to phenomenal online teaching programs. If you're not aware of them and you want more information, you can definitely check it out. Send me an email. I'm happy to tell you how to connect. Some of Dr. Meyer's honors and awards include the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, which is also called the MacArthur Genius Award for good reason. Uh, the Open Society Institute Faculty Scholars Award in the project of the Project on Death in America, the Founders Award of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, ARP's Social Impact Award. She received the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Lifetime Achievement Award back in 2009, and she's continued to do more since then. So there's an ongoing, maybe she's in her second time, Lifetime Achievement Award. She was a Health and Aging Policy Fellow in Washington, D.C. in 2009 to 2010. Uh, she received the Gustav O. Leinhardt Award of National Academy of Medicine and the American Hospital Association HRET Trust Award. She has published more than 200 works in peer-reviewed medical literature, as well as books and extensive online materials through CAPSI and Media Presence. You guys should check out the feature done on her in the New York Times Magazine a few months ago. Um, I've had the pleasure and, and really great privilege of training under Dr. Meyer, and I'm grateful for so much that she has taught me over the years. It's always amazing to me the number of people that she has personally helped in addition to everything she's done in kind of a national level with the establishment of her organization. Just you speak to so many people that she has helped um, to establish themselves as careers, not to mention all the patients and families. Um, and I can tell you that with everything that I have said and her many, many awards for publications, I know from talking to her that it always comes down to one thing, which is improving the care for patients and families. Um, that is really defining for her for everything she does. And she's, she's actually pretty humble despite this incredible uh, history. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Meyer. Wow, Rachel, I have to stop crying in order to be able to speak. What an incredibly generous and kind introduction. Um, I appreciate it. So um, when Rachel asked me to do grand rounds, I thought, well, you know, I could do the big picture grand rounds on what is palliative care, where does it come from, where does it need to go? And it just seemed a little off point given the what we have been through as a globe in the last 18 months and the impact of the pandemic, especially on not only um, health professionals, but very importantly on the patients and families who have been affected. So I decided instead to focus on really the impact of the pandemic on us and palliative care's role and contribution um, to facing this challenge. I titled this Listening for the Heart of the Matter, and it's interesting that Rachel pointed out that the whole point of all of this is to figure out what's best and what the patient and family need. And that's what this title gets at. 
subtitled Connecting with Your Seriously Ill Patients During COVID and Beyond. So um, this slide is the distribution of death from COVID. And this is probably changing somewhat um, with the increasing infection of younger people with the Delta variant. But prior to that, you can see overwhelmingly that while accounting for 11% of the population, people over age 70, um, the number of deaths over 70% occurred <clears throat> in older adults. So it was predominantly um, predominantly a problem for older people. Similarly, um, ethnicity, huge disproportion in the impact of the pandemic by race and ethnicity. And you can see here that white people make up about 60% of our population, but only 42% of deaths. Um, conversely, just looking at the bottom of the graph, 13%, Blacks make up 13% of the U.S. population, but nearly 20% of deaths. And those figures, that disproportion has continued and worsened since this graph was made. Um, not only have a lot of people died, the number has been so high that it this pandemic has actually caused a measurable decrease in life expectancy in the United States. Usually takes a really long time to measure any change in life expectancy, but over a very short period of time, ours has declined by a year, almost three times that much for Black people. Um, and erased all of the gains in life expectancy for Black Americans that occurred over the last 25 years. So a really stunning, shocking impact. Uh, this is a tweet uh, quoting Anthony Fauci um, from last February. Right now, COVID-19 is the leading cause of death in the US, which is just extraordinary. It's sad and tragic. And actually, when you look at the decrease in life expectancy, it's absolutely real and directly related to COVID. The differential among people of color versus white, again, underscores the disparities. So that's the demographic or epidemiologic impact. What about the healthcare system? Well, number one is that a lot of people lost their job. 70 million were already uninsured or underinsured before the pandemic started. An additional 15 million lost their employer sponsored insurance uh, in the last 18 months. Um, there were, as everyone knows, financial losses for providers, especially hospitals, due to reduced elective procedural volume and worsening payer mix. That is less commercial insurance, more self pay and Medicaid worsening racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes, and a massive public health infrastructure failure. The difficulty communicating with and getting shots in arms in this country is a national embarrassment. And for a little contrast, last week's New Yorker has a great article by Atul Gawande, um, uh, on the Costa Rica model, subtitled Healthcare That Understands Its Community. And it's remarkable, A, how much better life expectancy is in Costa Rica, and B, how much better the response to COVID and the protection of the population from COVID was in that country because of the link between the public health infrastructure and the delivery, the care delivery infrastructure. So, while all of this is happening, it it's, feels almost invisible to many people. Um, the, num the staggering death toll is everywhere and yet nowhere in America. Um, we're now at about 650,000 deaths, um, and the number of deaths is still increasing. The rate of increase is still increasing. Until about the last week, the rate of increase went from something like 20% per week to 11% per week uh, last week. And so this were, I sometimes wonder whether the increases in vitriol in social media and in all media are in some ways related to this repressed grief that's going on in the United States. 
Um, and this is a quote from NHPCO. There have been in the US alone now 650,000 COVID-19 related deaths. For each death, there are an average of nine people grieving. Thus today, we remember those who have died from this isolating disease and hold space for the well over 5 million friends and family who are grieving. Um, we're not good at grieving or paying attention to the need for grieving in this country. And when you think about the sheer number of people who have died and the sheer number of people who are grieving them, um, it's a major public health challenge. So what are the implications of this event? And I think it's actually probably too early to really fully understand the implications of this pandemic. It has not ended and we don't know when it's going to end. So we're still in the process of reacting, responding, trying to deal with a current crisis. Um, but here's some findings from a survey that we did, and you can see the link to the results um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, clinicians report many new responsibilities related to COVID, major increases in volume, adverse effects on program functions, loss of continuity of care, and real problems recruiting and retaining staff. A very large number of nurses have either retired, quit, left for better paying jobs, less intense jobs. Um, lots of worry among leaderships about team well-being and among palliative care program leadership, a widespread perception that palliative care is much more visible and much more highly valued than it was before the pandemic. I'll be interested to hear if that's your perception as well. Um, when we asked, how is your team doing? We got a very uh, large range of responses. While 71% said their staff were demonstrating resiliency and emotional well-being, 61%, 60% also said their, their staff demonstrated burnout and distress and a, a sense of loss and grief. Um, we asked uh, respondents, I'm just gonna shut this door for a moment. We asked respondents um, what they were hearing from patients and families, and they sent us a bunch of quotes from patients and families about the, their experience with palliative care during the pandemic. We didn't realize that someone still provided medicine that spoke to the experience of the patient and family. You were the only ray of light. We didn't feel like anyone was hearing us before you talked to us today. I feel less alone. You have been a bright spot in a dismal time. So now I want to talk about communication um, because communication is the secret that allows palliative care to connect with patients at times of incredible hardship and stress. So what is it? The word comes from the Latin communicare, to share. Communication requires a sender to transmit a message to a recipient who then decodes and interprets and makes sense of the message. Uh, communication can occur verbally, non-verbally, in writing, through pictures. Um, and its purpose is to develop meaning, shared meaning among entities through mutually understood semiotic signs, symbols. I'm going to um, use quotes through this talk from a book which has been incredibly influential for me uh, personally and professionally. It's called A Fortunate Man, The Story of a Country Doctor by John Berger. Um, it was published in 1967. The photos are by a man named John Moore. John Berger um, was a brilliant, basically, thinker, polymath, public intellectual. Many of you may know of him from his book, Ways of Seeing, which is about art 
and how we look at art and take in art. But another of his books, um, the For A Fortunate Man, was written uh, after he followed a, a English country doctor, John Sassel, um, on his rounds for about a year. Um, and the quotes are from that book. In illness, human connections are severed. Illness separates and leads to a distorted, fragmented sense of self. The doctor, through his or her relationship with the patient, and by means of the special intimacy he is allowed, compensates for these broken connections and reaffirms the social meaning and value of the patient's sense of self. What words describe effective communication? So if I were in the same room with you guys, I would ask you to shout out words that describe effective communication or to write them into the chat. Um, because I think we all know what, what those words might be. Um, but uh, they're often honored in the breach. So characteristics of effective communication, understanding where the recipient is in their understanding, what they understand already, and what they want to know or are ready to know. So not assuming that everyone wants the information we wanna provide, but asking first. Our attitude needing to be one of openness and curiosity and focus and attention helping the patient to feel seen. Um, emotion eats content for lunch. And this is something that we don't get taught in medical and nursing school, the attentiveness to emotion, both in the room, in the patient, in the family. But if we're inattentive to that, we're talking to ourselves when we try to convey content. Um, therefore, notice, name, and respond to emotion first so that content can then be heard and understood. Um, and, and a quick, um, basically mnemonic for remembering how to do this is ask, tell, ask. So begin by asking what the patient understands about what's going on before you start talking. What have the other doctors told you? What have other people told you? Um, ask them whether they're the kind of person who wants all the details or prefers a more general outline. So for example, I will say to a patient, some of my patients like to know every detail about what's going on. And some of my patients prefer a more general outline or actually would like me to speak to someone else, like someone in their family. Which kind of person are you? So I don't devalue the person who actually doesn't want to know, and I give people the opportunity to say, actually, I'd like you to talk to my son, um, or actually, I don't want to talk about this. Because if I go ahead and provide information they're not ready for or don't want, trust will be permanently lost um, with that patient. And respect for autonomy involves respecting the person's desire or lack of desire for information. Um, tell, you know, say 85% say, I, please tell me, doctor, I want to know what's going on. Um, the vast majority want to know, but not all. And then tell them, I'm sorry to say your CAT scan looks like you have COVID pneumonia. And then stop talking and allow silence, which is the hardest thing for us clinicians to do. Just let that information sink in. That silence is hard for us, not because we're impatient, but because we wanna fix it. We wanna jump in and make it better. We wanna say something that will make the, the impact of what we just said less. Um, so it's, it's good intentions that cause us to jump in at this point, but the patient can't hear much of anything we're saying after we deliver news like that. That's why allowing silence is critical. And that silence is maybe five seconds. 
10 seconds. And then ask the patient if they have questions, ask them if they understood, if what you said makes sense, if they understood it, um, if they can give it back to you, because sometimes we use jargon, sometimes what we think is clear is not so clear. So ask, tell, ask. Uh, another quote from a fortunate man, he does more than treat them when they are ill. He is the objective witness of their lives. So what is essential during COVID-19? And I love this article from the Washington Post, which was written by a, uh, a resident at New York Hospital during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the title was coronavirus has given doctors a new job palliative care but but the subtitle it's not just about treatment we also need to make sure that our patients feel seen reiterates what Berger is writing about in a fortunate man that what what is the feeling of being infected by this plague becoming someone that no one can be in the room with unless they're wearing a spacesuit, becoming someone that is dangerous to one's own family and children and friends, incredible stigma, incredible fear and anxiety, and loss of sense of self and loss of identity. So I want to uh, spent a little time on a patient that I took care of some years ago, and her situation was so powerful for me and so changed my perspective on myself and on my colleagues that I actually wrote it up and published it in Health Affairs um, in their Narrative Matter section. It was an article titled, I Don't Want Jenny to Th Think I'm Abandoning Her. This is a photo, Jenny is not her real name, but this is a photo of the actual patient uh, during the time that I was taking care of her. Um, she, when I first met her, had had non-small cell lung cancer for over five years. Um, she was receiving care from an oncologist um, at a competitor cancer center. And she showed up in my geriatrics practice and, you know, look at the photo, remembering the photo of her, she did not fit in at all in my geriatrics practice. Most of my patients were over 85, over 90. Um, and she was not only very young, but looked perfectly healthy and um, well. So she and her husband were in my office and I said, what brings you in to see me? And she told the story of her cancer and said, I keep asking my oncologist what's going to happen when these treatments stop working. He just says not to worry. I have more treatments he can, we can try. And she was really afraid of what was going to happen. How was she going to die? Was she going to suffocate? Was she going to cough up blood? Was she going to be in terrible pain? were her husband and daughter going to have to witness that she like most of our patients kind of has been taught by the media to be terrified of dying um, it's presented as a terrifying event um, and people don't know that most of the time it is not terrifying and so when she kept asking her doctor what's going to happen she was speaking to that growing fear that she she was facing a really traumatic um, dying process. Um, she was happened to be a clinical psychologist. And as a clinical psychologist, she knew that her oncologist just couldn't go there, that he was unable to address um, what would inevitably happen when treatment stopped working and so she she found me on google and made an appointment and came in <laughs> um, what she described is that she was consumed by anxiety and fear of unbearable pain suffocating and exposing her family to that suffering and she finally said what is it like to die 
what will happen to me? So this is a pretty self-aware patient um, who was able to name her emotion and articulate it. Um, most of our patients are probably not that um, attuned to what their feelings are and how to, how to put words around them. But I will tell you that almost every patient has this fear. And it may manifest in different ways, um, may manifest in behaviors that don't make sense to us. It may manifest in lack of adherence to treatments. It may manifest in not showing up to appointments, um, but it is a universal fear. So thinking about her oncologist and how he responded to her repeated efforts to talk about what she was so afraid of, what words would you use to describe ineffective communication? And very clearly not responding to her emotion that is dismissing her emotion and saying, we don't have to worry about that is an example of ineffective communication. And yet clearly he was doing that to reassure her, reassure her and himself that everything's going to be fine. He thought he was responding when in fact he was not responding to her emotion. So I hesitated because sometimes people actually don't want to know what they're asking for. So I asked, would you like to talk about what it is like to die? And she and her husband said, yes, you know, like finally someone's asking me the question. So I described the natural dying process. And what I said was about 90% of the time, people get more and more fatigued and sleepier and sleepier, spend more and more time in a chair and then in bed. And during that process have less and less interest in eating and eventually less interest in drinking as well and gradually sleep all of the time and then gradually sink into a coma, uh, a period of not being responsive. And during that time, as there's less intake, um, the body begins to shut down. That's the natural dying process. Uh, breathing can become quite rapid, like much more rapid than usual. Many family members fear that the patient is having trouble breathing or is struggling to breathe. That is not what's happening. It's just a natural process of the body shutting down. Um, intermittently with in between those rapid breathing, there may be pauses and some of those pauses can be as long as 30 seconds. Some can be as short as five seconds. And that period of intermittent rapid breathing and intermittent pauses can also go on for several days. During one of those pauses, the patient will die. Uh, nine out of 10 times, that is a very peaceful, natural and comfortable process. In the one out of 10 patients who develop symptom distress, whether it's restlessness or agitation or anxiety or pain or shortness of breath, we have very effective medications that will be kept in the refrigerator. So who's ever with you, your husband, your daughter can administer those medications right away. So there will be no periods of time of uncontrolled symptom distress. And then I stopped talking. And the relief on her and her husband's face, the relief in the room was palpable because it wasn't the nightmare that she was fearful of. So I asked, is this what you wanted to understand? Do you have questions? There was huge relief. They were smiling. They were joking. She spent the rest of the visit talking to me about the various book groups she was in. And I continued to care for her along with her oncologist for the next 18 months, mostly um, by phone and email and text, but uh, also she came into the office. And this is a photo of uh, Jenny and her husband, George, and their daughter, Sarah, on one of several trips to Europe they were able to take, thanks to the great care that she was getting from her oncologist. So 18 months later, 
after I initially met her. Uh, Jenny called me to say that she had been in to see her oncologist because she was having trouble with concentration and focus and headaches due to brain mets. And she had asked her oncologist whether there was anything more that he could recommend. She had been maxed out on steroids, maxed out on radiation therapy, and really had no further chemo available. So she went to see him and he recommended intrathecal chemotherapy. For those of you who are not clinicians, that involves placing a pump into the brain and directly administering chemotherapy into the metastatic lesion in the brain. Um, and she called me and said that he had suggested this, what did I think? So what do you think I thought? So my reaction was, what could he possibly be thinking of? And then I caught myself, I did not say that to Jenny. I said, you know, Jenny, I'm really not familiar with the with the effect of this procedure in patients like you, let me call your doctor and ask him what he's hoping we can accomplish. And one of us will get back to you. So I called him. I said, you know, hi, Dr. C. Uh, I got a call from Jenny just now. She said she had been in to see you today and that you had recommended intrathecal chemotherapy. And I'm not really familiar with this um, procedure in this situation. What are you hoping we can accomplish? And he answered right away, it won't help her. And there was a bit of a pause while I tried to gather myself. And then remembering that I was the consultant, not the treating physician, I said, do you want me to help? Do you want me to encourage her to go ahead with it anyway? Even though he had just said it won't help. And he said, I don't want Jenny to think I'm abandoning her. After actually quite a long pause, maybe five seconds, which for two doctors on the phone is a long pause. Um, and this was a massive light bulb moment for me in understanding why I sometimes saw clinicians offer treatments to patients that were not only unlikely to help, were quite likely to hurt in terms of risk and harm to the patient, um, and yet still offering treatment. And I had not understood the reasons, the emotions behind that behavior on the part of my colleagues. And Dr. C really helped me to understand it, that it was a form of showing love and connection to his patient. It was a way to say, I'm still here. I will always be here for you. I will never abandon you. Um, unfortunately, the only way that that particular clinician knew how to show non-abandonment was by offering intrathecal chemotherapy. Um, and therein lies the importance of training in communication and in palliative care for clinicians. So this was really the most important lesson of my career so far. Um, so what, what was the problem here? This, this really is a superb oncologist who deeply cares about his patients and deeply cared about Jenny, um, which she knew. What was the problem? Not a lack of caring, not a lack of experience or knowledge. It was actually a lack of training in how to continue to care for and be committed to and stay connected to a patient once our technologies are no longer beneficial. That the real tragedy of medical education is that it implicitly conveys the notion that we are only our procedures, we are only our drugs. We are only our imaging procedures. We are only our surgical procedures. And we are so much more than that to our patients. And that is a failure of medical education. So 
the solution sadly is training um and what the reason i say sadly is because it's a big job to train every mid-career professional in this country who never got this training during medical school during nursing school during residency um, and yet that's exactly what we have to do because it's a huge gap this is a photo of jenny and her family about i don't know about eight days before she died i took this on my iphone on a home visit um, after Dr. C said, I don't want Jenny to think I'm abandoning her. And he said out loud what had previously been unconscious for him. He said, we're not going to do that. It's time to refer her to hospice. And he did refer her to hospice. And I continued to care for her as her hospice attending physician and visited her at home over roughly the next three months. And on this visit, I asked her a question I frequently ask in patients at this stage of life. Um, after I'm done asking, you know, when was your last bowel movement and how are you sleeping and what's your pain level and um, things like that, I asked an open ended question, which was, how are you feeling inside yourself? And very often my patients answer that question with something like, I'm talking to God. Um, and in, in the case of Jenny, I had this fantasy that she was gonna tell me that she was ready to repair her relationship with her mother. She had not spoken with her mother for 20 years. And her mother was not only still alive, still healthy in her eighties. Um, and I kind of, hope that this gap could be could be healed before Jenny died. Um, a, a form of palliative care arrogance, I guess I would say. Um, but that's not what Jenny said. When I asked her how she was feeling inside herself, she said, I'm really concerned that Dr. C has not called me or been to see me in this whole time that I've been home on hospice I thought he really cared about me. So the relationship with the doctor was the thing that was on her mind. The loss of the relationship with the doctor was the thing that was consuming her in her life during these last days. Um, and many patients say that they feel actually abandoned, exactly what Dr. C um, was afraid of once they go to hospice they never hear from their doctor again and yet that relationship is so central to the patient's sense of purpose and identity and value as a fellow human being and we cut them off from it because we think we have nothing to offer so i said to her um i got her permission i asked her if i could call her oncologist and i did i went back to the office and i called him and said, you know, hi, Dr. C, I was in to see Jenny today and she'd really like to see you. And his reaction was very um, irritable. Why? Isn't she home on hospice? There's nothing I can do for her. That's what he said. There's nothing I can do for her. He, he, he himself believed that if he had no chemo to offer, he had nothing to offer, which again is tragic. Um, and I said to him, she's very grateful to you. She's very fond of you. She wants to say thank you. And she wants to say goodbye. And Dr. C made his first home visit. He, he worked roughly 10 blocks from where she lived. And he went over there and she said those things. And she died maybe three or four days later. And the next time I saw him was at her funeral. Um, he is now the director of the cancer center uh, at the competitor medical center and has two fully staffed palliative care teams in his cancer center. Um, all thanks to Jenny, who has um, continued teaching us all. Um, so this is an interesting sentence. You cannot not communicate. Um, written by a guy named Paul Watzlawick, who, who I had never heard of till I started researching this talk. 
He wrote that once proximity exists between two people, living creatures begin interpreting signals, intentional or not. They may be content and relational, they may be verbal or nonverbal. When verbal messages contradict nonverbal messages, nonverbal messages win. This is also a place where emotion eats content for lunch and are used to judge our attitude, feelings, and intentions. This is why, if you guys could see me, you know, I am sitting with my arms crossed and my legs crossed. No matter what I say, my body is saying, I can't wait to get out of here. And I'd really rather be anywhere from but here. And I'm tense and I'm leaning back in my chair. So when I'm teaching medical students, I talk about body language and say, put both your feet on the floor and put your hands on your legs. Because if you sit with an open body language, that will send the message that you are open and you are present. You will also feel open and present because your body is open and present. Nonverbal communication is omnipresent, involving body, face, voice, appearance. This is why we don't wear t-shirts and blue jeans to work. Touch, distance, am I standing at the door holding the doorknob? Timing, am I looking at my watch? Um, and space, am I sitting down in an eye level with the patient or standing over them? Very powerful messages that kind of sweep away anything we may say. And there are so many barriers to effective communication, especially now, especially in this intensive, volume-driven, time-constrained, money-stimulated, healthcare system. And these are just a few of the um, barriers that, that I could think of. Um, I was talking to one of our fellows the other day uh, who was seeing a patient in our practice who was not vaccinated against COVID. And she was furious. Why did she have to expose herself to this risk? Um, because this patient not only refused to get vaccinated, he was exposing not only us, her, but everyone in the waiting room. Um, and that anger was definitely getting in the way of her ability to listen to him, pay attention, and provide care. And we actually had to talk about it. Um, I was her preceptor. Um, that that you know her anger and when she said yeah i'm angry it that made it possible for her to choose not to let the anger she basically just wanted to send him on his way um and uh turns out there was more to talk about all right so all these things get in the way of effective communication what can we do to fight these barriers Take two deep breaths, focus, bring our focus to the patient, put our feet flat on the floor, sit down, put our arms on our legs and bring our attention to the patient. There is no other way. So questions for you. Ask yourself, what's one word that des describes how you are feeling about your work right now? When I was asking the fellows about this earlier this week, they said, um, exhausted, angry, tired. Those were the words that came to mind. Have you noticed any silver linings from this pandemic? Are there things that you'll never take for granted again? after this is over, like sitting at the table with your family and having dinner, like seeing your relatives, like going to hear music live. So many things I'll never take for granted again. And that's part of the process of gratitude, 
and remembering the most important thing is human connection. These are resources on the CAPSI website, emotional, personal protective equipment, lots of resources for us on, on how to process what has happened, not only to us, but to our patients and families. Um, in a manner that enables us to remain professional and remain present. Um, these well-being well debriefings are one of the most effective um, mechanisms that we've been promulgating recently. They were developed by Vicki Leff, who is a social worker at Duke. Um, and what they involve is bringing people together within the workplace, whether at lunchtime, before a shift, after a shift, with a facilitator. And we provide the facil facilitator training is available for free on our website. And it's an opportunity for people to talk about the feelings occasioned by COVID. It is not a therapy session. It is basically about saying out loud what is unconscious and by saying out loud what is unconscious such as i don't want jenny to think i'm abandoning her you then have a conscious choice about how those feelings influence you in one of the sessions that i sat in on it was a group of icu nurses um, at our hospital and um, the session started with some kind of nervous joking around. People didn't know what to expect or what this was going to be like. And somebody said, um, I just don't know how much longer I can take this. I'm, for the first time in my life, I'm thinking about leaving nursing. And everyone else was having the same feelings and had never really said them out loud or said them out loud to one another. And the relief in the room was palpable. And because it was permissible to say this impermissible thing out loud and to realize that so many people were feeling this, it became normalized. It actually became humorous, the conversation and that the mood in the room lightened enormously and the connection between people strengthened enormously. And um, those nurses later described that session as a turning point in their ability to carry on. Um, here's some more resources. I think you guys have these slides so you can, um, you can look at them at your leisure. This is a quote from a, a medical ethicist named David Barnard, who was writing quite a while ago, 25 years ago. The sting of illness and death is the specter of broken relationships and the loss of the world. Over and against this threat stand the efforts of caregivers like us and companions to embrace the sufferer and continuously reaffirm his or her capacity for relationship. When you think about what Jenny was seeking from Dr. C, it was her relationship with him. That was the healing power. That's what she was seeking. Um, and very fortunately for both of them, he was able, he was able to meet her there. And then I'll just close with this uh, Mary Oliver poem called Thirst. In a book called Thirst, the poem is called Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. And this poem captures why it is such an incredible privilege to work in healthcare and take care of our, fellow, our fellows in their time of need. 
Um, so I hope we can try to hold on to that, not only for the sake of our patients and their families, but very much for our own sakes as well. <laughs>